Shama, welcome to our podcast. Thank you for having me. I have been watching the podcast <laughs> on and off for a long time. Thank you very much. So the background to this particular episode is, as I told you, I wanted to interview a little bit more Mauritian athletes because I think we've got amazing talent, both past and, and present. And your cousin kindly recommended me to you, <laughs> Abza. So he talked about football, but as a, as a fan, yes, not as, a, a, as fan. a player. Unfortunately, his team lost, lost yeah. <laughs> so I'm sure he was a bit disappointed so you're an ex well I want to say ex because I think once you're a champion you're always a champion badminton champion where did that passion come from it was actually a family business well business is not the thing but it was a family thing I have four older cousins who were in the national team at one point their mother was a coach she's from India she married my uncle she moved to Mauritius and she started a badminton school. I remember we couldn't find a name. At that time, there were various cartoons which we were watching on TV, and there was one called Thundercats. I don't know if you remember yes, that. Yes, of course, of course. So I she named her badminton school Thundercats at wow. that point. And we would imagine ourselves like I was the girl who was running fast, you know, and the <laughs> stuff like that. So it was basically just following my older cousins because. When we were at home at my grandmother during the holidays, they had to leave for training at one point. And then I was left behind. So I said, I want to go, I want to go. How young were you then? I must have been five or six. So you were really young. You yeah, young. yeah. When I was six, I started going on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And then when, I start, when holidays finished, I went after school also. And there was quite a lot of kids in the club. She started at Regis Chaperon in the hall there, and then we moved to Corum in Stanley. And at that time, in the badminton landscape in Mauritius, you had lots of clubs. So there were the inter-clubs tournaments and where you get to meet, to meet other players from other areas. Mm-hmm. I remember there was Kessrel from Suyak. They were quite strong. So, you know, like if last year you lost to Kessrel, this year you want to beat Kessrel and all that. So, all the, so all the clubs were playing against yeah, each all other. The clubs. There was like a tournament. Exactly. Okay. And the better ones, they were training with the national team other days of the week, and then you could train with your club some days during the week. So, it, and then you met the other people also. So, the, so you were playing, waiting to be called in the national team. You know, so if you are going to play in the inter club, it was a good platform for everyone else in the federation to to see you, to spot you. Yeah, and exactly. Spot the so it was always, and when you were there, also you were watching the elders play. You know, they had a different charisma, they could do things, and then you said, like, you want to be like them when you grow up. So that's how it started, actually. At what point did you move to kind of national, like elite level? Yeah, <laughs> it, it was never a conscious decision. It was just like things kept falling into place. And because my elder cousins were already in the national team, doing the Jeux des Îles, going for African champs, and it was like, I would like to do that too, you know, I want to do that. And at, at that time, there was what, uh, I, I don't think it's here anymore, they did Jeux de l'Avenir and Jeux de l'Espoir. It was a national thing by town or village. And you went to, it was over two or three days, but during these days, you went to sleep in a school somewhere. So you didn't come back home. And like, they went for that. And I was like, wow, we are sleeping away. I want to do that too. So sure. unfortunately, when it reached my age, there was still the tournament, but we went back home afterwards. So. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't get the sleepover. Yeah. So it was just like following in the steps of what they had, or other tournaments they had already played, you know, and watching them play. I remember watching two sisters play the finals. And when one won, one lost, the other one cried, so the one who won also started to cry because her sister was crying. And it was all the drama around yes, it. Sure. And we would laugh about it a month later. So it was just such a family thing. But over and above the family, it was the badminton family also because we grew, you started growing up with these people. Like you form a bond. Exactly, with them, exactly. Yeah. So, and then around 12, I was called in the junior team but it's not a team like we train with a national team but we don't yet go for tournaments we're just getting the and then you move from training two times a week to five times a week so then it became quickly it became routine you know I was I think in form one then 
So every day after school, you know, you have to go to training. It's not like, and I remember when I was training twice a week, when it was first day, I was feeling very sad because I had to wake a long time until Tuesday, you know. I was so there was no training over the weekend? No, there was no training. So you were feeling very sad, like you have to wake a long time till Tuesday and, uh, and then there's the weekend, is going to be boring. So you were always looking forward to play. So when it became five times a week, it was like ideal, including Saturdays. And my parents were like, when will you do, like, you have to go for tuition, you have to go with everything. I was like... Because you were already in secondary by then. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So it was always having to manage it. And my friends always asked me, when do you do your homework? Where do you get the energy? Are you not tired? But... I wasn't because since a young age, it's been part of my routine. It's like I it started like that. So it was never a question of put the tuition and then schedule the training. It was there's the school and the training. Where do I slot in the tuition in between? You know, so. Yes. And, and also, I think from, from how you're talking about it, it seems like for you, it was a passion. It wasn't work. You didn't yeah, see it as exactly. work. Exactly. And. And I didn't have much, I don't remember having the ambition to be then, to be national champion or African champion or anything. It was just like loving to go to training and play. And if I didn't go, I missed it. I remember I didn't, like Christmas time, it closes for three weeks. I was very upset, you know, because you couldn't even go and play somewhere. You can't play in the yard because yes, it's, and you can't, it's not a game you can play by yourself. Exactly. <laughs> I used to play against the wall. It's actually oh, really? a very good training. Wow. I used okay. to play in my room and it's actually a training thing. Even when we became seniors, you get a coach from China or Malaysia. Okay. They want you to hit 100 times against the wall without letting the shuttle fall down. And if it falls down, then you start again from zero and all that stuff. So wow. okay. when I was younger, I used to play against the wall. We did some matches. The wall, the wall won most of them. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not the same thing. Sure, sure. And so when it moved from there, we started. When we were juniors, you got the opportunity at the end of the year to do a, a, a tournament in Reunion Island. Then all the kids would go, like 12 kids. That was our first travel, yeah. solo, no parents. It's head, exciting, I yeah, say. But head full of instructions, you know, no mo <laughs> because there were no mobile also. So be careful, be careful of everything, don't go alone anywhere. When you reach, give us a call. And then, you know, every every night you have to look for a phone somewhere, put in your oh, coins. Yes, I remember. <laughs> I mean, at the time there was no, no such thing as a mobile phone. But at what point did you feel, because you said you never had particularly the aspiration to, you know, I want to be a champion. At, at what point did you feel, I want to win? Was that ever... It's when you see others winning, when you, you, you look at, you know the hard work they've done because we all train together. The juniors are there, the elders are here, but our training times are more or less the same. So when you look, you know the hard work they've put in and when, when you see them winning, you know, it's like the happiness of it and the satisfaction. So when you see that, you say, I want that too. You know, and when you start doing the tournaments also, because if you are training, you have to do the tournaments. You know, and you lose first round, you feel disappointed. And you, you've tasted that disappointment, you know, and you know you could have done better because you were stressed or because you weren't so much into it. So there were all that kinds of small, small things. If you wore the red T-shirt or the black T-shirt and all that stuff. So for next time, then you try to get better and get better. Once you start doing the tournaments, it's like you always have to do better. So you do the local tournaments, then you have to do better. You do the regional ones and you meet that guy from Seychelles who beat you last time. So this time you want to win and then it goes and it goes on and on. It's it's a bit like a drug if you want, but it's like you it's need, a good drug. It's, yeah, it's a good team, drug. It's in, a good in drug. A good way. Yeah, like, what, what was the kind of how would you describe the highest point of your career and the lowest point of your career? I always tend to remember the lowest points than the highest points and like. For me, there are so many other girls who I who have done so much better than me on the badminton front. You know, I think of Martin de Souza, Amrita Sawaram. They were at one point African champions and all that. For me, is that in the years where I could have won, let's say, an African title, maybe it's a small thing that, let's say, I will take 2011. Okay. I was maybe third in the team, okay. um, ladies singles wise. Huh? 
because we played singles and doubles. So I was not expected to bring a medal or to win for the singles. Okay. I was expected at the African Championship, uh, okay. which was in Seychelles. Sure. But I was training a lot on my own because I wanted to go for the singles. So I was training a lot on my own. But I was third on the team. It was a right. It was the place where I was because we did the local ranking tournaments Selection, and all that. Yeah. But when I when I reach there, sometimes it's just a click, and you are in a good place, and everything goes as they should. You want the shuttle to go there; it will go there. And I was in a good place then. I had an injury. I was playing with it, but I was still in a good place. And I remember. I, the first two girls, unfortunately, one got a tough draw, the other one was at maybe in such a good place. I got a good draw, I was in a good place, I reached the semi-finals quite easily. The others were already out. out of it, yeah. And the semi-finals, I won a match, but I wasn't expected to win. So I was in the finals and I was very surprised and happy and all Who that. were you against, do you remember? I was in the semi-finals with a Seychelles girl called Alison coming. And I had never won against her before. So, so I, I won a, and yeah, I was, was happy a... and I felt good. You know, you fly on the court, you are everywhere and it was a wow thing. And then, so I won, I went back to the village and the next day I had the finals and I was the only one in the finals of the singles and the mixed doubles with my partner. And suddenly it all came down crashing on me, you know, like, is it the I, expectation you put yeah, on yourself? Yeah, I, I put it on myself. It's not anyone else. And I remember I was sitting on the beach and I, you have a nut in your throat, your chest is tight and you want to cry. And you, but the crying doesn't help, actually. And course, it's at course. that time that you need someone, let's say a coach, to be able to talk you through it. And, you know, in 2011, I had already more than 10 years experience in tournaments, I played the 2003 in Mauritius. It's not my first finals. But even then, at times like this, you need someone to course, hold your hand. To talk you which, up and, yeah. yeah. Which was lacking for me there. Sure. And when I went to the stadium the next day to warm up, so I went before everyone else, like my teammates, mm -hmm. and I reached the stadium, I was warming up, I was okay. And it's very, very tough. One of the toughest places to play is in Seychelles because the home crowd loves their players. Really? So it's going to be loud. It's going to be, they are going to tease you. They are going to be a bit naughty. And it's one of the toughest places I have That's played. That's interesting because they've got such a small population that I yes, wouldn't have Yes, but they love their that... players. Really? They, are, they love their players. And you know, when, when the Seychelles players are playing in Seychelles, so all their family, friends and everything fill the stadium. It happened for us in 2003 in Mauritius. So I can't say it's one way. And they make a lot of noise and they are mischievous, you know, so when it's very distracting. It's actually. very distracting. And I remember a guy came from Mauritius, the fan club from Mauritius came and they opened a flag which was the same size as this room and they let it up because they were up and they let it down. Yeah. When I look at the flag, I felt such a stress. I never got into my game. No. <laughs> yeah, it, it's like, it should have had the opposite effect. Of course. You know, like it was. Is, is it because you felt like they, they expected you to win? So, I, I mean, was, they, yeah. it's like the pressure you put on yourself. I was floored when I saw that flag and I, and I never got in my game. I remember, and I went, when we started to play, I forgot it for a while. I was leading, I think, 7 3. We finished at 11 or 15, I forgot. But when I remember when I said, I can do this, after that, I never scored a point. <laughs> so, really? You know, and then in times, and this always stayed with me because this was a time when I could have won something that was unexpected. So it wasn't actually, from what you're saying, it wasn't actually technical proficiency. It was... Yeah, it was in mindset. my head. Yeah, mm. yeah. And some months later, we played the Mauritius Internationals, which is on the African circuit. But then I had started playing my singles more regularly and more seriously because before that I was thought to be a doubles player mainly. But then I wanted to give a hand to try my singles. So Mauritius Internationals, I had the same semi-finals against Alison, which I won. And then I had the same person who I lost to in the finals in Seychelles. But here I was in Mauritius, that's one thing. I came back from India where I had done some tournaments, so I was feeling very confident. confident yeah. 
and this time I won and everybody was like, wow, you got your revenge and everything. But it, it, it was never feel. revenge. Mm. It didn't feel like it because the, the Indian, the Judaism is one thing. Other international tournaments on the circuit is something else, you know. So, and for me, it was like, everybody remembers, ah, you won the internationals a year later. I was like, no, but I lost the finals oh, in 2000. I think you're being too harsh on yourself, to be like, honest. Like, I'm always <laughs> fixated on yeah. what I lost instead of really enjoying, you know, yeah, what you the won. Vi the so, victory, yeah, yeah. that's the... That's my... <laughs> Your opinion. <Yeah. laughs> so if you were... I thought it was quite interesting what you said about mindset. So if you were to give a percentage of, you know, to, to win a game, and I'm, I'm always interested in the psychology of, of athletes, like in terms of percentage, how much do you think is attributable to technical proficiency and how much is attributable to your mind strength? I don't think there's an answer to that because the technical proficiency, it comes from training, like hours, hours of doing the same stuff over and over again. So if you don't have, you need to have that at least as a starting point. So then you can go on court and you can do what you have to do. And then there's the mental preparation behind. But if your mindset is 100% ready, but you don't have a technical proficiency or you don't know what to do, yeah. it's not going to be any use. You know, you, like, so I think one works in pair with the other so, and needs to be as worked on. You need to work on both mm. as much as... It's just like having an exam, actually. You may have done your revision fully, You know everything, but you can't deal with the stress of the exam once you sit at your desk. Yeah, if you have a mind blank or... Exactly. Yeah. Or you can say, yeah, I'm prepared, I'm prepared, but you've not done any work. So when sure. you sit in front, you look at the paper, it means nothing to you. So it's just it's just the same thing, actually. It, it has to, to work. And even for your mindset, you are more confident when you know you've done the work be before. You've done the training, you, so you come in prepared, then you are confident and you know... You, If you come in confident, but you are not prepared, yeah, I think that says a lot. A, yeah, yeah, and then it says, as you said, it says a lot about the mentality of the, the attitude. Exactly, of the exactly. And did you have the support back then? You know, because when we look at athletes now, they, they, you know, they were so well surrounded. I'm not sure about Mauritius, but, you know, at least internationally, you have your doctor, you have your physio, you have your mental coach. What was the support that, that you got? Uh, definitely, we didn't have <laughs> I think, unfortunately, all of this fell on the coach. Mm. And sometimes you had very good coaches and other times lesser qualified coaches, all doing the best they can, but having to wear multiple hats because the coach is some, sometimes a parent also. You know, when you travel, you're, you're young, your parents are not with you. You are going through difficult times. You lose a game, you're depressed, but you need to be up and running for the next game. So... You don't have a psychologist on hand for that. So everything came down on the coach. I'm not sure they were always prepared to have that role. Sometimes some of them did, some of them less so. Even the thing is, I think even the athletes, sometimes they, they, are, they tend to be too demanding on that one person. So yes, now you see it more and more when, when you watch, because I watch Wimbledon during the, on, 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 Friday, on Sunday. Yeah. And you see now that when a player congratulates the winner, they also congratulate the team because it's like you have your guy performing there, but he's doing that performance because of four or five yes. other guys around yes. him. And yes, it's not the coach sitting in the box, it's the team sitting in the box. So it's really a team effort. So it's a team effort on and off the, the court. So, but even now, as we were chatting earlier, with uh, disabled teams, I find them, now they have a team, and you can see the, the hard work is paying off. And I it's mean, you've seen the, exactly. the um, silver medal. That exactly, and it's not the hard work of one or two years, it's the hard work of eight to 10 years, and it's paying off now. So one other thing in, in sports is you have to persevere, you have to hang in there, it's going to happen, and it's, it's never a quick fix. It's, now we can't compare it to academia because you study one year for exams at the end of the year. For sports, it's a lifetime, exactly. almost like a lifetime. Do you still play any sports? No, not badminton. I started playing paddle for a while. Oh, okay. And then I played for a year. And then my past badminton injuries played up a bit. Oh. 
So I took a rest. Because it's quite high impact, isn't it? Yeah, it's thinking, high yeah. impact. And as you say, we didn't understand so much the importance of recovery then. Now it's more, it's, it's as important as training. So, and I think recovery is not just physical, it's mental recovery. You have to take a break. I remember I had a coach once, we were training very hard. And one day I told him, you know, first time in my life when I come in the badminton hall, and I love the badminton hall. It's green, you have your white line. So when you come in, especially early morning, it's still a bit cool. They put on the lights, you know, it's pow. So I love the badminton court. And I told him the first, it's the first time in my life when I come in a badminton hall, I feel nauseated. It's like, um, I don't want to be here. I know I have to play. Because you were overtrained. And then he said, you know, there's a trail. I think the trail thing was just starting at that point, the, cra the trail craze. Yes. So he said, there's a trail at Domaine de la Grave, I think next week or this week. I put your name for it. Go. You don't have to run. You don't have to win. You just walk and take your time, do whatever you want. If you feel like running, you run. If you feel like walking, you walk. And I'm actually a person who hates long distance running. <laughs> Same as me. <laughs> I can't run for more than 100 meters without feeling so I, tired. Even in training, you know, there were days where you had to run like one hour running. That was the day I hated all, wow. always. Around the court. Yeah. Mm. So just one hour. Even if he had told us to run outside, I would have hated it as much. And he told me, go do the trail. And I did my first and only trail. But I really enjoyed it. Since then, I went on hikes and stuff. And I walked with an old lady. I wouldn't know her or remember her now. But we walked together and we had a chat. And then she said, and then people, one or two people told me, oh, you're the one who plays badminton. And I felt like I had to run a bit now. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, how fit is she? <laughs> so I ran a bit and then I walked a bit. But it was fun, like jumping in the mud. Not too nice on the ankles and the knees also. But, but just to get your mind off. Yeah, the, and then, the you know, the outdoors, mind. just... Yeah, being in nature, exactly. and absorbing everything. And then after that, he started doing what we would call cross-training. You know, we would go on corners, mm -hmm. climb up the hill, walk a bit. And so that, that made it better. This thing is usually happens after a tournament also. If you've trained very hard, you know, you focused on... It's like an anti-climax. Exactly, almost. exactly. Mm -hmm. So suddenly it's finished. You don't know what's next or you know what's next, but it's in six, seven months and you're like... Yeah, because you hear of stories of, you know, athletes at really high level, I think even like Michael Phelps, who fall into deep depression after because it's like, okay, I had this one goal, I've achieved it, so what and do I do with my And there was this hype now? climbing up to it, you're training for it every day. It's, it's eating into your life, you know, you breathe it, you eat it, you sleep it, and then you, and it happens. You deliver or you don't, but the aftermath is always like a crash. A crash, yeah. So, it is a bit like a drug then. <laughs> it, <laughs> it is. <laughs> There's the analogy again, yeah. yeah, but that's true. And how did it, I mean, surely, you know, because, you know, you were so passionate about it and you, you know, you played so many games, so many international tournaments, won so many medals, and you did that alongside with your career, I would have thought to some extent. How did what you learned in sports translate into your, your career? Did it help you in some way be a better professional? I think one thing that it gave me was confidence. Because since a young age, my first tournament, we played not in front of a big crowd, but there were always people there and you were Watching. performing in front of them. So I remember when I had to do my first presentation at university, you, know, you speak in front of a jury of a panel or even at work when you had to do a pitch. Mm -hmm. I was never worried about how I was going to talk, how I was going to stand or, you know, have a trembling voice. And so that, that came naturally. And I think it gave me a kind of edge because I was always confident, not overconfident, mm -hmm. but I would say à l'aise dans ma peau, you know, I was... Yeah. And, it always seemed nothing was like, I wouldn't say insignifiant, mm -hmm. but it was like, I have been there, but everything else was here. So really? I never took too much stress. Everything yeah. was You fine. didn't take yourself it, too seriously. It was in my yeah. stride. It yeah. was easy. I wouldn't say easy, but it's fine. It's like, 
if I had a very strict boss who was very bad tempered and was shouting all the time. You didn't take it personally. I or, didn't take it yeah. personally because I've been with 10 coaches. All of them had different temperaments. All of them were men. Yeah, I'm sure mo- yeah. a lot of them were screaming as exactly. well. Exactly. <laughs> so if you start working and your first boss is a strict boss and you see sometimes you have a girl crying. You know, like, I always took it in my stride, you know, it was easy. Sure. Now the bosses can't be like that anymore. Of course, so yeah, of course. Violence you be fired for that now. <laughs> but it was part of it, you know, it, sure. it helps for your carapace. So I would say I had a good carapace on me. Do you miss it? I, I miss the win. I miss the adrenaline of it. I miss the feel good after the training. But I don't miss the, the crash, you know. Like now it's a more constant uh, constant and stable (laughs) life. You know, when you see your kids crying about something that is very important for them and it's funny because you really, it's in real, yeah. Yeah, you can relate. But it's a very stable life now, you know, you don't have, and like I remember if you've set a goal to win a very important match, you lose it. It's difficult on your partner also who's living with you because like you crash. Well, you already, you were already I was, married. I'm married in 2010 and my best badminton years were between 2011 and 15. So it's important also to have someone at home who understands you. Yeah. Before it was your parents, now it has to be your partner, you know, and he was, he is, he was, he is very easy on that kind of like letting you do what you want to do. And, but also, you know, when you crash or when you are depressed, they want to be there, but they, you think they will not understand because they have not gone through it. But it's a different thing for them because they see you going through, the, through it, but they can't help you more than helpless. you want to be helped. Yeah, and then sure. your crash, it can last one week, it can last two weeks. And so it's, it, a sports person is a difficult person to live with. It's a bit really. Yeah. I think so because unless it's a sports couple, I guess because maybe, they know what yeah. the others and who are do. not competitive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're not competing against each other. <laughs> because I remember I was in the first years of my marriage. I was waking up at four, four thirty, leaving home for training. I train five to eight. I go to work. After work, I go back to training five to eight. I'm back at half past eight, nine. Luckily, because I live near the badminton hall, which was in Rosier. And by the time you are back, you want to sit in, take a shower, sit in front of a TV and chill. And maybe he's talking or maybe he's not talking. You know, sometimes you zone out. Sometimes you have your own troubles. Ah, I didn't do this while I'm training today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or ah, my knee's hurting. I need to think what I'm doing. And, but he also has his life, but. Of course. uh, an athlete is often very self-centered also, you know, but not selfishly self-centered, but because you are focused on something and sometimes this focus becomes the only focus. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like Friday night, if you want to go out with your friends, you will tell him, you go, I can't go, I have training tomorrow morning or I just came back from training, I'm tired. I can't count the number of Saturdays I slept in a cinema. <laughs> Really, <laughs> you're just crashing because you've been like working so hard. But did becoming a mother change your perspective? Um, yeah, it, it changed the importance that badminton had for me, actually. And I would say badminton because I never really did well in any other sports. I, I played fairly OK in some, but I wouldn't say I was an all rounder athlete like some people are. So when I became a mother, so at first you have a break you can't anyway even if i had the time i wouldn't have been able to go back on court and when i did i could see that i had lost so you know the the others were training while you were not training so when i came back i could already see your level had suffered yeah so you had to work doubly hard to catch up with them but you couldn't put in that double work at the expense of some someone else while I was not yet a mother, I thought like, at the expense of a husband, it's okay, he's an adult, he can take care of himself and he will understand. And he knew what was there going in, you know, because so sure. he, he knew that he was knew your passion. He knew how my life was. Mm. But I couldn't do that at, at the expense of someone who is innocent, you know, and hasn't asked to be here. And, and who is ex- wholly dependent on you. Exactly. And at the expense of asking the grandmothers to 
we never say no. We always we still say yes all the time, but it's like primarily it's your job to be a mother sure, you know sure. and they are here as a support system but they're not here to do your job for you of course so of course. this is where and it it wasn't a difficult decision or, yeah or i don't have any regrets also because it was a natural flow yeah. i n- no longer wanted to be on court so much like i knew it was easy because i knew my time had come so it wasn't like i had to stop it was regret it's, it's, this is one thing I don't look, I, I look back on, but I have no regret because it was a natural thing. Yeah. My kids regret because they tell me now, why you don't stay, why you don't play badminton? Because they love it when we go somewhere. It happens more and more rarely that people recognize me before it used to be more sure, often, sure. but now it's more. So how, do, how old are they now? Nine and six. Okay. So they are like, why you don't play anymore? Why? So when we see in the newspaper, I will tell them, you know, look at my friend Julien, he won and all that. And he says, so why didn't you go? You are not the champion anymore. And I was like, <laughs> no, but now I'm not. And then when they tell me, but you should play. And then I tell them, but if I play, I will travel a lot. Ah, no, 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 don't play, stay here, stay here. Oh. So they want you to be a champion, but they yes, don't want but you to Yes, but you play. have to still be available 24-7. <laughs> Do so, they play? No, no. I've tried to get them to play. They didn't like it so much. So I didn't force it. I let it go. And I didn't teach them to play. I took them to a coach because I don't think you can be a parent at a coach. Yes, well, I, I can't think be you, a parent yeah, there would be coach. some friction there. But they didn't like it as much as I did. And... So I said, you know, if I force them, they might hate it. Now it's just that they did not like it. So maybe they were not ready. So I said, I'll just give it a rest. I'll try again in a year. If they want to, they will stick to it. If they don't want to, they will find something that suits them, you know. And I can't expect, I would love for them to do a competitive sport. It doesn't have to be badminton because for me, it's, it's really a school of life. Yes, no, I, I completely agree. And, and this is one of the things that I would, I wish for, for my kids as well. I mean, at the moment, they're not very interested in, in, in it, but that's one of the things growing up I wish I had spent, invested more time in. And obviously, as you know, as you age, it's no matter how mentally strong you are, the body, the won't, body follow. won't follow. <laughs> exactly. I keep teasing everyone around me and saying that. So my colleague and I have started boxing, which we're really enjoying. But it's more, you know, obviously it's not to go into competitive boxing. But but yeah, it's it's. I think it builds character in a way that no academic book. Exactly. And because, you know, one thing which is funny, I started playing when I was seven. I won my first single titles, the national champion. And singles is always more important. You know, you can win 20 titles in doubles. If you haven't won a singles, nobody will remember you in a way. Yes, of course. I won my first singles title when I was 21, and which is considered late. Those who started oh, really? winning were winning it at 17, 18. Interesting. And I have more bronze medals than silver or gold. You know, when I open, I left all the medals and trophies at my mom's place. It already has its shelf there. But when I look at them, I see there's always so many bronze medals. You can't count. It was like there were more than 10 years of losing before I started winning. And I think, and I was really a late bloomer. Like I said, my best years were between 2011 and 15. I stopped at 2017. So I was a late bloomer. But if I had stopped when I was losing, I wouldn't have had the best years. Which... And you, you probably, now, now you can safely say you have no regrets, but you probably would have had regrets if you had stopped. Exactly. Then. And I would have been an okay player, you know, I wouldn't have. Like, in my last years, I won the Botswana Internationals, the Uganda Internationals. Like, I had the opportunity to get a sponsor, and he helped me to go to those African circuits and all that. So... In those later years is when I won. I started really winning on the singles front. And I was training with the boys. I remember I thought, like, if I played the boys tournament in Mauritius, I would be number four. And I was very (laughs) proud, you know. Amazing. Even the boys would tell you, hey, come play with us. And when we have mixed doubles, they want you to play with them. So it took coming from here to there. It took more than 10, 12 years. And it's what I think 
what I would love my kids to know that you don't get something, you know, because you want it. Or, and now these days things happen too quickly and too easily. So if you want it, you really you have to, to, to give to get and it takes from you also, it yeah. takes a lot, but you have to, you have to stick to it. And it's not like, as you, as you said, it doesn't have to be something academic as long as it, it, it is something that builds that character. Character, yeah. exactly. Because discipline. even at work, what's always, like, for me, like, I, I was say the pressure was never too much at work because I've had so much pressure before. Mm -hmm. We haven't reached that stage where I think, you know, you think you're you can't I'm burning speak out or, and yeah. everything. But always, it was also always pers persevere, you know, like you have a tough thing to do. You give to the client, he's not happy. You go back to the drawing board. You come back, yeah. Yeah. he's not happy, he's not happy. But you keep doing your best. Mm -hmm. It's what I think like the sport, like being competitive told me, you know, you keep trying to give your best yeah. and it's going to pay off at one time. So that's for me, that's school of life, you know. Yeah. And it's what I would love my kids or like, I really think, children today need to learn that because they get it so even true. from me. <laughs> even I was telling a friend the other day, I was like, I used to take the bus every day to, you know, walk to the bus stop, wait for the bus. Sometimes it's full, you wait for the next one. Now they're driven everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. And it's our fault. Yeah, of course it's our fault. And last, I remember also when you say we took the bus, well, in my earlier years, I was going to BPS in Bobasa. So after school, you have training in Rosil. So you have your school bag. And then you have your badminton bag, which is bulky. So when you get in the bus, everybody is eye eyeballing because you, you, no take, you take so much space. You know, you, you hit with everyone. And when I walk from the bus station in Rosil to the badminton hall, which is quite a long bit mm -hmm. because you need to go through the whole Arab town, the market, yeah. Stade Rosil and all that. The boys on the bus station, they used to, hey, look at Tochi Ninja, look at... Because, you know, you have this big bag on your... So. <laughs> And I always knew, you know, they were there on Mondays and Wednesdays, and I had to go uh, through that. That's probably character building as well, exactly, actually. Because you have to keep going to it. And then when you start winning a junior tournament and all that, they will tell you, hey, you won last week. <laughs> and then, you, know, you, feel, you feel your face become hot. <laughs> and even in Arab town, there was a fruit merchant there. He's still working, the guy. And he would always say, look, She's going to train, don't know if she will win next week. And then if you lose, last, next time you pause, he will tell oh, you. Uh, so he's watching, you know, he's I never got you. the guts to tell him something. You know, oh. I always walk by, I walk by. But now when I go these days, you he will something. look at me, he will just smile, you know, he will not say anything. He will just smile when I bring my kids. You know, we used to drink aluda and everything. So I, I, I took my kids. The aluda guy and the roti guy, they were always very nice. But oh, the fruit guy, he was always, had always the teasing me. Yeah. <laughs> and now when I go, he's always, he won't talk to me, but he'll just give a small smile. He's probably he'll thinking laugh. what he was saying before. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chama. I think what you've said is precisely why I wanted to have episodes on Mauritian athletes. I think there are so many skills that we can learn from athletes or doing sports just generally. It doesn't necessarily have to be at yeah. competitive level, that life is not just about diplomas and books, yeah, etc. And it's about losing and getting back yes, up. So exactly. I, think, I think losing is actually more important than winning. You need to lose a lot, not a lot, but you need to go through that sure. to really enjoy your win or to know how to get back up. I think that's important. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for having me.